And I'm going to ask a big favor. Okay, you guys can see the recording on there, right? At the, on your screen? Okay, if it goes off, somebody needs to warn me, okay? Because I'll be busy doing something on this, looking at my book or whatever, and it happened this morning. So I just wanted to <laughs> make sure somebody tells me because I don't want it to, you know, not record for an hour or whatever. Because then nobody gets credit. <laughs> See, we all have to work together. <laughs> all right. So Ms. Connie left you off yesterday on profiles. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, we have to do like old school, old school. That's what I call it too, because my girls had to do the same thing this morning. So like, this is hard. I'm like, yeah, because you guys are pretty much um, instant information, right? Use everything online and when it goes down, boy, it's, it messes with everything. So you have to go back to what we used to do. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's start off with a straight profile. Okay. This is someone that has a very slight outward curvature from the front hairline to the tip of the nose, and then from the tip of the nose to the chin. All right. So if you want to write this down, it's a slight outward curvature from the front hairline to the tip of the nose. So it's going to go like kind of like this. It's considered to be the ideal profile. Let's put it that way. Okay. The face and the hairline can be totally exposed and they can wear most of any type of a haircut. Let me um, put these people in. Are you still there, you guys? Miss Janie, Leslie's waiting in the meeting room. I got her. Well, where'd you guys go? Okay, there you are. It's a different computer, so I'm, I'm having a little bit of difficulty trying to, to get my things together here, okay? Thank you for telling me she was there. Is she in now? Yes. That was Leslie, you said? Yeah, thank you. Ashley? No, it's Leslie. Okay. Thank you. Huh? And who else? Ashley's on here, though. I'm right here. Right. Did I let you in just now? Uh, I've been on here since one, so you should have. Who else did I just let in here? I let in uh, I'm here, Ms. Jamie. Okay, we got you. All right, I just want to make sure because I'm not familiar with you guys. So if you want to get credit, I want to make sure I give credit to everybody. Okay. Um, did you give Vanessa? Um, did she just come in? Yeah. On there. She's already on there. Okay. I basically have Elizabeth, Leslie, Luna, um, Isabella, Alejandro, Ashley, Junior, Jasmine, Judith, Max, Sandra, Tree. Am I saying that right, Trace? Trace? Um, Valerie. And I'm not, I can't pronounce that one. I'm sorry. It's X I L. How do you say that? Please. X I L T A L I. No one's, no one's talking. Yeah, I can't pronounce the name. I'm sorry. Okay. Shay, Alyssa, Vanessa, Nick, Jessica, Brenda, Kayla, Carly, Leslie, and Ashley. Who else did I forget? No one? Okay. What was that, Miss Jamie? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I was just taking roll again, okay? <laughs> All right. So we're going to go back to um, our straight profile, okay? So their haircuts, like we said, they can wear any type of a haircut. The beard, they can wear any beard design. It doesn't need, we don't even need a beard camouflage any balances on a face because it's it's a perfectly balanced face okay um, the convex this one has a prominent nose on there first of all right so it has a strong outward curvature it results from protruding the nose and sloping the forehead 
or the chin. So the size of the nose draws attention to it. Like the first thing you see is the nose because it's the most dominant. On a haircut, they would need um, volume or fringe around the length or the forehead. You want to avoid too much length or fullness at the nape. You want to wear their hair slightly longer. They want to direct their hair away from their face at the sides and forehead. And a side part draws attention away from their center of the face. Most people that have, uh, that wear a center part, you're going to see any flaw in there unless they have the perfect face. So if their nose is just a little bit off or it's a little bit too large or it's a little bit too small, wearing a part down the middle is going to automatically draw attention to it because it's like splitting the face in half. So you see right towards the nose. So that's why they said maybe a side part, it takes the attention. Even if you don't want to wear it like completely over to the side, just a little off center is enough to take the, the attention away from the nose. Um, their beard. They can wear a beard or a goatee. That will basically help with the balance of the convex profile. It adds fullness to a receding chin. Um, balancing the shape using the beard or goatee or a mustache to make the facial, appear facial appearances more proportional. Okay. Oh, she's talking to somebody else. I'm like, oh, I'm waiting for somebody to talk. I thought Shay was saying something else. <laughs> she's just no, we're listening. Okay. Okay, the concave profile. Okay, they have an inward curve, and they often result in a dominant or protruding forehead and chin with a small nose. Uh-oh, hold on. We've got another one coming in. There's a... Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. So again, the concave has an inward curve with a protruding forehead and chin and a small nose. Their haircut options would be to cover the forehead with longer lengths and their beard, a fuller mustache can help create a more balanced profile on this type of um, profile. A full beard trimmed or shorter at the chin and left fuller at the sides can often offset the elongation often associated with this profile because this gets too long right through here. And then you have an angular profile. Okay, this is a somewhat sloping forehead combined with a strong or protruding jaw or chin. So the haircut on this one would be to cover the forehead and create more balance or more balanced appearance. Um, adding a mustache or a close cut beard will visually soften the shape around the jawline so it won't be so prominent. Any questions on those three, four, just yet? No? Am I keeping you guys awake or what? <laughs> no one's talking. I'm like, I'm used to people talking back, okay? <laughs> All right, they go into your facial features, okay? Um, other features that we have to pay attention to when we're looking for haircuts. In most men's haircuts, the haircut line is partially or fully exposed, so it's not necessary to incorporate, say, the natural growth patterns into the finished design. Because usually women in the back, when their hairline kind of grows up like this, you can either give them a C shape, or you can make it into a B, or you can even make a W in the back, okay, just to go with the hairline and the growth patterns. So men's nape hairlines grow longer, or excuse me, lower than women's, which allows you to cut a more squared or masculine look or form. Whether it's receding or not, the hair at the front hairline is often finer, so with less density than the hair on the rest of the head. This can limit the shapes that you're able to create and support a haircut, so it must be <laughs> carefully considered. So if someone doesn't have a lot of hair up here, you're going to have to balance what you have, especially if the Receding hairline goes back towards this way. Um, a high or receding hairline can alter the visual proportions of the face, making it appear longer. So you'll have to alter your design to offset this perception. So just be aware of the changes in density and texture, particularly near the hairline, because these irregular irregularities may require you to adapt or length or choose a different technique to create the more consistent results. 
a lot of us have learned how to do a solid cut. We've learned how to do um, a 90 degree, okay? All of the basic haircuts, okay? And when you're first learning how to do this, who did I just let in? Uh, Kayla, is that you? Okay. All right. When you're first learning those haircuts, you're just trying to get well, the- I'm already here. I, was just, I just moved to my laptop because my phone died. Oh, okay. Um, what happens is you learn how to do the haircut really well, okay? But when you get to be a better stylist, what you're going to learn is if you can do that same style, and I'm not saying haircut, I'm saying style on every person and it looks a little bit differently. So like you've already learned how to compensate for somebody that has a weak forehead or weak hairline, okay? So you've made that 90 degree haircut a little bit more balanced or you've added a little bit more fullness around the nape of the hair. Okay, these are things that you'll learn later on, but while you're still in school, you're still trying to get that 90 degree, that 45, okay, you're over directed, whatever haircut you're trying to learn. But a true person that can do this can make that 90 degree look like a 90 degree on somebody that has a full head of hair, okay, because we all know a full head of hair and a 90 degree looks really well. It looks good, okay, but when you can make it look like the same on somebody that has very fine hair and thin hair, then you know you've done your job. Does that make sense to you guys? Because I couldn't, I couldn't understand that at the beginning. I was really could not understand that because I was so focused on making sure that my lines met and everything matched together. Okay, and I had a barber teach me and he kept saying, you have to learn to make that haircut look the same as full as it is on somebody that has fine hair. And that means you can't cut it the same way. And I'm like, well, then how am I supposed to cut it? He's like, you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how you're gonna compensate for those areas that are weak. And you will too. Okay, I remember him telling me one thing that did stick into my mind is when we're doing a men's haircut, we're always doing basically the interior part of the head first, like you're layering first, and then you're doing your frame last, if at all, because you're going to blend it with their neck. Okay, but on a woman, you're doing that frame first and then putting in your layers because when you do it that way, you leave the base of it all the way around the bottom a little bit thicker because it doesn't cut into the hairline. So that's one way of learning how to make somebody that has very fine hair, okay, make it look like it's fuller. Do you get what I'm saying on that part? Okay. Because it took me a long time to really understand that. And then I started to notice what he was doing. I'm like, yeah, I get what you're trying to say. We learn how to do these haircuts and then we think that they work the same on everybody. And I remember getting a haircut from somebody that gave me the same haircut that my girlfriend had, okay? But it did not look like the same. I was very weak because I don't have a lot of hair in between this part of my head. Okay, it's kind of like a little bald, but she had a full head of hair, so it looked great on her, but me, it looked like two big wings coming right here. There was, this hair just hung down. And it was because he did not know how to cut the hair properly. So I learned too, that you want to make everybody look really good, right? We all do. Okay, so let's go into your sideburns then, okay? The overall design of your sideburn should take into account the length and shape of the sideburns which serve, serve as your natural transition to an op optional facial hair. I have to tell you this story. You guys are going to just die laughing because you're going to think this is really so old and crazy, okay? But this guy came in, and he didn't have much hair here. He, he dragged the five little hairs he had and, and sprayed it all up so it looked like he had a little bit of hair up here. And he had his hair about right about to here. It was about in the 80s, okay? So he had a little layered haircut, but he had very fine hair. He tried to take the bottom hair and he wanted to keep his ears covered. Little did I know that his sideburn hair wasn't very wiry, so he combed it all the way back to cover his ear. So that made the hair, because his hair only stopped at his ear, it made it look like his hair was covering from his ear, okay, from here down to here. And so when I went to trim his sideburns, I went to cut there and, and shave around it, and he's like, Miss Janie? Uh-huh. Oh, Ashley's in there. Um, okay. Ashley said if you can let her in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So he was all upset. Don't cut that. And I'm like, okay. And then I looked at it and I'm like, you're using your sideburn hair to cover the length of your hair over your ears. So I'm like, I just stood there and I was like, I have not heard this ever in my life. But that's basically what he did because the hair on his sideburns was a very soft, smooth hair. And he did cover it. And it did look like that the side of his hair came down to his ears, but it didn't. It was his ear hair because his hair only stopped right here. So some people will be very creative in making their hair look very full or that they're not bald, okay? Trust me. 
I, I just can't even believe it. I wash somebody's hair and you think that there was a full head of hair and there was like this long string that hung from the other side of the head. They, they had sprayed and sprayed and filled it up and made it wrap around the top of their head. And I'm like, they do get very creative. I think they should be in beauty school themselves or barber school or something. Cause I don't think I can make it look the way he had it looking at all. Okay, so going back to your sideburns, all right? Like haircuts, sideburn styles can change with fashion and trends, okay? So a good haircut can make it unattractive if the hair, if the sideburns aren't considered in the total look. So your sideburn length should be determined by, okay, these three things. Your facial structure, the overall size, um, the individual's features, and then one more, the visual balance between the bottom of the sideburn and the nape hairline. When you're looking at the style from a profile look, okay? So you're gonna look at this right here, and you're gonna look at the back right here. You can't see me. Huh? Oh, he's got a shelter, but it would be from here and to here in the back, okay? Using the sideburn length and the length in the back of their head. Sideburns can alter the overall look of the haircut on the, and the client's face. They can be used to slim the face or balance the facial features. Okay, few people have perfectly symmetrical features. So your sideburns are used to help create the illusion of symmetry. Here's another thing. Not everybody's ears are the same. Okay, so I'm gonna show you on mine. I usually take two combs when I'm showing a client this. Okay, and I will place them on the bottom of their earlobes. Okay, hold on, can you see this? Do I look even? I don't look even, do I? Okay, that's usually what most people have. One side's a little off. And so it's kind of funny when you start to balance your haircut and you're like, I didn't even know his ears were off that much. But you can't see it from the front. Look at them when you're looking straight on. So you'll have to just be careful when you're measuring up those sideburns. Because I would get them and I'd go, how come that doesn't lay right? And the same thing happens when I'm in a, in a waxing room when gentlemen want me to wax their sideburn hair to balance it out, okay? They want to lay down to have me do the waxing part of it, but when they sit up, the skin moves. So I can balance it here, but when they sit up, the skin, especially if they're more mature and they've got a little bit of looser skin, what happens is it drags down and then they're really off. So it's almost like you want to do it when they're sitting up, but it's kind of hard to hold the wax when they're sitting up. But you're going to be doing the same thing when you're trying to balance their haircut. Okay, and sometimes it just takes two combs and holding it like this so you can catch the difference in this in the way that it sits. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. All right, so it says to check for the sideburn symmetry. Okay, using the mirror at your station, you're gonna look at the client's face like head on or front on. Have them slowly turn to one side, then the other while you place one index finger at the bottom of each sideburn. This helps you check that the sideburns are indeed at level with one another. Okay, I like to take my combs because I can see them, they're a lot bigger <laughs> for me. Okay, all right, the client's hair growth pattern and density will also factor into your sideburn design and your choices. Thin or sparse hair looks pretty patchy or spotty if it's cut too close to the skin because it lacks that definition and that weight. Your thicker, dense, or especially dark hair can look too heavy or full, so it requires an additional length and weight reduction to balance with the haircut and face. Most of you are barbers in here, okay? I'm not sure about you, but when I'm cutting around this part of it, I will comb it straight back and clean up around this part of the ear. And then I kind of drag it forward like this and drag it this way, and it kind of gets some of that bolt off of there. Okay, I don't know what Ms. Connie has shown you, but that's basically how I can get rid of some of that. And if it still needs a little bit more, because it's too full, I'll run the comb up this way and I can take it off. Do you know what I mean? Just run it up like a clipper over comb through the ear. But at first, just dragging it back and cleaning up around that part, dragging it forward and cleaning it up along this line. You can usually take out some of that bowl. Okay, so most clients have a sparse area where the hair from the head transitions into the sideburn or facial hair. Leaving the hair in this area slightly longer can help create that illusion of consistent density, which means more hair, okay? Regardless of the density, color, or growth, the sideburns in the haircut should transition to each other without an obvious line. Okay, so be intentional in either blending it or not blending them into the client's beard. There's a picture here, but some of you have your books, right? Your little, um, the Barber's Book of 104B.2, I guess, that's where we're at, on page 49, yeah. 
Okay, so there's pictures at the bottom where it talks about the different side rooms for the right side and the visual effects that they create. All right. So sideburns are well proportioned to the face. They usually extend to about the middle of the ear. Okay, that's a clipper cut. All right. Short horizontal sideburns make the bottom of the face appear longer, fuller, and can make their ears look long, larger. They don't really like that part. Okay. Shorter diagonal sideburns can accentuate their cheekbones. So it gives them a nice jaw too. All right. Long. Horizontal sideburns can slim the face and make the ears look smaller. I still think it looks like um, Elvis <laughs> to me. Okay, but moving on. And then the long, thin sideburns increase the distance from the nose to the sideburns, where the face looks wider or fuller, especially when you look front on. Okay, are you getting this, guys? Yeah? I'm glad. I got some people going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. All right, another area you have to look for, okay, are ears, right? Because they're not always even either, right? So you want to consider the size and placement of the client's ears when you're creating hairstyles. A client with larger ears or ears that protrude from the head benefits from additional fullness at the sides and sometimes even a longer length to cover the tops of those ears. And this will create the illusion that the ears sit closer to the head instead of popping out. Larger or longer ears can also be offset somewhat by sideburns. Well, do you know who I am? I was raised in LA, so I had a couple of clients that were actually um, news anchormen. And I had one that had one ear totally pinned to his skin on the side. So when I was trying to cut around his ear, I normally would run my finger like this so I can cut around the side of it. And the first time I did that, it didn't move. And he kind of giggled at me. I go, what's so funny? And he said, he goes, my ears used to, he goes, I used to be Dumbo. He goes, I swear. He goes, so the studios actually had me have surgery and I had to pin my ear back like this. And his ear was stuck like that and I couldn't cut around it. So I would cut so far to here and then I cut around this side just to get it even around his ear. So I was like, I had never seen anything like that. People do the strangest things to make their hairstyles work. Okay, eyeglasses, okay. Clients might ask for advice on what type of glasses they should wear. More often, you'll be adapting your work to the glasses that the client already wears. In general, the client's sense of style and face shape should determine the choice of their eyeglass frames and the same principles of their proportion applying to their hairstyles. So, since many men haircuts are shorter, remember that the more of the eyeglass frame may be visible. So, especially around the temple or the arm that extends to the top of that ear, some men mistakenly shave all the way up to the arm of those glasses. And unfortunately, this creates an unflattering proportion from the profile view and can make the lower portion of their face look longer or heavier. And that's when they start to wear a little facial hair to make it look thinner. So they say that ears and nose appear to get bigger as we age. So keep this in mind if you have mature clients. Have any of you had an older gentleman or a more mature client, let's put it that way, Okay, and you notice that their ears are rather large. Mr. Aiden himself had one of the largest ears I've ever seen. And we had, he had taken a reflexology class that I was teaching there for a while. And it was so easy to be able to get my finger in every little crevice of his ear because it was so big. But it seems like the ear just grows larger and larger, right? What's actually happening is this is cartilage, okay? It's not like the rest of your face on that skull. So as we start to lose that collagen that's in our face, and we do lose 1% every year after the age of 24, it makes this skin lay closer to the muscle or the bone of the face. So it looks like it's more slender. Then we have gravity coming up, pulling it like this. So on our ears, they look like they're a little bit bigger because there isn't anything there, okay? As this starts to get smaller, this looks larger. Does that make sense to you guys? Because it's not going to really get that much larger if you think about it but it is cartilage and the rest of our face has muscle on it. So the muscle is gonna to start to drag because of that weight. And then the skin looks thinner or your bone structure actually protrudes a little bit more. All right, your natural hair color or your hair color that you have and the coloring of it. When clients want to change their hair color, be sure to analyze their natural coloring. The right hair color can either emphasize their natural skin tone, it can emphasize their eye color, 
It can even make the client look healthier. And to determine the most flattering colors for your clients, analyze the pigment in their hair. Look at their eyes, their lips, their skin. Determine whether the client color scheme tends to be warm, cool, or neutral. Warm colors will contain like yellows, oranges, and reds. And cool colors will contain blue, greens, and violets. Your neutral colors will be browns. Um, they'll contain all three primary colors, which is yellow, red, and blue, but determine whether the intensity of those colors is either mild or strong. Is it a mild warm, mild warm or a cool warm, that type of stuff. Um, I've always looked at, when I'm looking at skin tones, I also look at their veins too, because sometimes that can give you a clue. Um, when someone wants to change their color, they usually have the color swatches right there to tell you this is the color they want. Or they looked around the room and they found a color that they like. Let's just start with a blonde. I want to be that blonde over there, okay? And you're looking at that client and looking at her skin and the lady that or man that she's looking at is a cool complexion and it's got a cool blonde on it. And your client is a warm. Okay, that color is not going to look that nice on her. But instead of saying that I can't get you that color, you can get them a, a blonde, but not in that tone. So a lot of times I will take the swatches, comb the hair back this way, and lay the swatch it, fan it out across their forehead so they can see that that color lays next to their skin tone and make the decision themselves. You're right, that's not my color, okay? It doesn't mean I can't have it, I just can't have that tone of color. Does that make sense? Because I have a lot of people on the blondes are like, I want to be that blonde. And it's like, okay, I'm going to lay that up there and show you how pale you are. <laughs> that color doesn't go that well with you. But I can get you another color that will actually make you look much better. Okay. But it's going to be a different tone. Okay. So that's a good idea of actually getting those color swatches up. Just check on that. And so let them, they'll automatically sway. Oh, no, that's not, no, I don't want that. Because it's better than you making that color choice for her after she said, this is what I want. You mix up the color, you apply it to her, and after you're all done, she's like, that's not what I wanted, because that's not what she expected her hair to look like. It didn't look like that other person over there. Okay, so letting her see that beforehand saves a lot of time in English. Okay, so remember that the hair texture, density, and condition, and growth patterns all play a role in the design decision process. Okay, these are all in chapter on chapter eight or eight into the Cosmo books, but it's in the 104B.2 in your barber's book. All right, we can go into your clothing styles, right? Clothing and lifestyle go hand in hand with knowing how to style hair for an individual. Ask clients or ask questions about your client's clothing style. Do they get it so that you get a full picture of who they are? Because many men switch their styles as they move between work and personal time. Shorts and sneakers on the weekend, maybe a change to somebody that's wearing a suit all week. Okay. Be careful not to confuse style, which has longevity, and trends, which are very short-lived. A man's sense of style is something developed and nurtured over time, while trends may last only a season. You might be able to help your clients determine which trends or elements or current trends might be worth incorporating into their personal style. Okay, designers in the fashion industry identify several clothing styles for men and the following types are general guidelines that can make it easy for you to help and help and understand and not label your clients. So you have casual and easy going, okay, is your first one, all right? This tends not to care about fashion, but is often well put together. They're unconstricted lines and shapes in easy textures and fabrics. Their likes are comfortable, low maintenance clothing, and their environment. Comfortable, relaxed fit, but not too oversized or baggy pants. Okay, comfortable shoes, sneakers, boots, um, blue jeans, t-shirts, and sweatshirts. They do prefer a low maintenance haircut, and the hair is easy, easy to style without minimal product, if any at all. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna let somebody else in here. Bring her in, okay, hold on. There you go, sorry. 
All right. What? Vanessa. Vanessa, can you hear me? Vanessa? Sorry, you guys. Vanessa. <laughs> okay. I don't think Vanessa's available right now. I know. Well, I've went in twice, okay, and, she, and it says <laughs> that it says connecting to the audio, and I can't see her yet, so I'm like, okay. I had well, one. She probably has, she probably has bad connection. I have bad connection myself. I know. That's what I'm saying. But it was up there. She was up there twice, so I was like, okay, maybe she's getting one. She can't hear the. <laughs> I know this connection is bad. All right, since I went very fast with this, somebody tell me um, some of the some of the styles that I just labeled for the casual easygoing. What were some of the um, things that I told you would be under the casual? Go ahead. Sideburns. What? What? I didn't hear what that was said. Okay, here we go. Give me one of the options I gave you for like their style. What type of clothing would they wear? Clean. Clean. How about um, what type of shoes would they wear? Sneakers, comfortable ones, right? This is a casual person. Okay. Well, what do you define casual? Because sometimes some people casual is with boots. That's, that's what we were just discussing. Okay. So under the casual, this is somebody that likes low maintenance kind of clothing. Okay. So they're comfortable and relaxed fit, but not oversized or baggy pants. Okay. They're going to be comfortable in comfortable shoes and sneakers. Maybe boots, uh, blue jeans, t-shirts, sweatshirts. They're going to prefer a low maintenance haircut and something that's easy to style without a lot of cut. So I just wanted you to give me a couple of the things that you remember because we got interrupted there. <laughs> Sometimes the train of thought goes out the door when the, someone tries to come in the door on the zoo. All right, how about a natural explorer? This is someone that has, that likes easy fabrics, soft textures like canvas or corduroy or even flannels. They like flannels. They're the outdoorsy kind of techie clothing person. Um, they're sporty, but they're not oversized or baggy. Um, they like neutral colors. They're health conscious. They care about the environment. They like low maintenance hairstyles that don't require any styling products. Okay, so there's that type of client. All right, then you have a traditional corporate type of client. Okay, and this is somebody that's going to wear a suit and a tie almost every day. Okay, their clothing is high quality, well tailored. They dress to impress. They lead others. They'll wear dress shoes that are shined. They've got quality expensive watch okay they can fall into multiple categories when they're not in the corporate gear they like to wear um, a tapered haircut the hair should be totally groomed yet look effortless no fuss okay um, nothing that's going to attract unnecessary attention okay they like contrasting lengths and sometimes a little color okay so then you have the athletic type of client, okay? And they like comfortable, breathable, flexible fabrics, okay? The clothing typically is designed to be functional, lightweight, practical, and comfortable. They often look like they just came from the gym or they're going to the gym. They're gonna wear athletic brands and logos. 
Sometimes the dresses, they dress to highlight their physical fitness. Those, you know. <laughs> but they prefer low maintenance hairstyles, but might, they might be a regular client. Might be. All right, and then you have your classic client, okay? Their wardrobe is coordinated without looking like it took too much effort, okay? Um, every piece of clothing is well chosen, and they have a traditional design look. Their looks are refined and carefully coordinated, even on casual days. So avoid extremes, modify their trends, and go for a simple version. They wear prep styles and can fall into this, this type of category. Tailored yet relaxed, simple, smooth, softer textures. They're likely to wear classic hairstyle that's easy to maintain. So you have your five different styles in the two on the next page. Ooh, let's go with those. All right, your dramatic rock star type of plan. Okay, they might wear sharp contrasts or monochromatic, like a black, all black, with minimal detail. They carry off sharp, crisp edges, bold structure. They'll wear high fashion. They seek attention and strive to stand out in the crowd. They can wear sleek, fitted, or streamlined looks. They can look like they're always put together, or they can have that bohemian look. Okay, they're, it allows the barber to stretch their creativity when they're giving them a haircut. <laughs> they seek out change. They embrace new and different styles. Okay, and they're not afraid to experiment with a haircut or a hairstyle. And then you have the urban style. Okay, they might have a hip hop vibe, oversized layered kind of clothing, denims that are usually distressed or sweatpants. Okay, logo conscious, they might wear caps or hats. They're conscious of their footwear, often specific on their sneaker style. And their haircuts often include meticulous fades, lineups, hair parts, hair tattoos. They can be the cutting edge extreme or the often signature for the client's look. So you got one, two, three, four, five, seven different styles, right? Okay, so you're going to look at these particular areas when you're trying to decide what type of category that client fits into. So look at their job or career, okay? Many of your clients will spend most of their time at work considering the following when they're making their design decisions. Functional demands, functional demands on their job and the type of image that job requires of them. Okay. Their hobbies, okay. things the clients do for fun, fitness or relaxation. You can place a demand on their hair, ask whether they have spare time. Activities will include posting any hair or beard restrictions or is it going to create problems that may be anticipated or planned for? Because some jobs don't allow them to show off their little tattoos and things like that. So they're not going to be a little crazy in their styles, as far as their hairstyles. Their family. Ask direct questions in order to clear up doubts and avoid later disappointments. Are their partners or their family preferences important to them? Do they have small children? If so, does this affect their choice of their hairstyle or their beard length in any way? Okay. And time. The amount of time that the client is willing and able to spend on their hairstyle and facial hair can give you an immediate indication of how much styling or makeup or upkeep can be required. The time will determine the maintenance it takes to do that style, the frequency of the shop visits. Okay, hold on. Uh, one more person. Oh. She left. She's gonna come back. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna switch devices. Oh, my sorry, I'm sorry. What? Okay. My phone was dying. All right. I switched devices. Okay. Okay. So to finish off that timeline, all right. Frequency of the shop visits, the products that need to be used and the tools needed to do those styles at home, okay? That's when you're asking about the time. Um, finances, okay? Make the costs involved with the client's hairstyle and facial hair clear ahead of time. Don't make surprises and tell them, you know, oh, this time it's gonna cost you this amount, all right? Tell them the cost of the initial style change if it needs to be, 
cost is associated with ongoing maintenance. And right now we're dealing with COVID, so that's a, a good reason. All right, reoccurring costs, including the frequency of the visits, okay. their at-home care, such as their beard trimming, any additional services such as lineups, including the frequency. I know on females, I would ask them because they have a tendency to want to trim those dang bangs of theirs, okay? And they mess up the whole haircut. And I go, if you don't cut your bangs and you come in between each haircut, okay, I will do the bangs for $5, okay? You just, I'll fit you in between somebody else, but I'm not doing a style on it. I go, that would stop them from cutting certain areas. And you can do the same with your clients, you know, give them some type of, I guess, ultimatum. Like, if you don't do the lineup and you don't try to fix it yourself, you know, I can clean you up in between haircuts and it's not the full charge of the haircut, if that's what you choose to do. Okay, the skills. Okay, clients may be willing to invest all the time and money in a certain look, but some of them may not have the skills to maintain it. We know it took us a little while to get used to that blow dryer, <laughs> the styling tools. So if your client's not used to it, you might have to show them how to do it. Provide a thorough explanation of the proper tools or products to use for their home maintenance and demonstrate the correct method and easiest techniques to achieve the results day to day. Because as it is, we tell our clients, well, in order for your hair to look as good as it does when I do it, you need to purchase the products to do that, to make your hair do that. Okay, especially when they're getting like, say a perm or color, you want them to be using professional products so it doesn't strip it. So a lot of times in order for you to get them to do their hair the same way, you might have to show them, spend a little extra time showing them or training them. Of course, you're going to charge for that. Okay, if the client can't be bothered with blow drying, don't give them a look that requires it. That's basically what they're saying. Okay, so once you understand the relationship between the hairstyles, the body types, face shapes, that combine the knowledge with your client's clothing and lifestyle choices, it helps you to develop the looks that are, I guess you could say, complement their personal sense of style. Okay, so let's look at some of the lessons that you learned in this chapter, okay? Hairstyles can be adapted to complement different body types that will include tall and length, can you give me a definition of tall and lanky? lanky? Okay, or what type of styles they would like or benefit from? No one? How about they would benefit from styles with added volume and or length, right? Okay. What about someone that has a rectangular shape? Okay, they can usually wear almost any hair length or style. The short and sturdy client will benefit from styles with height and volume at the top. Body shape will include the triangle, inverted triangle, rectangle, trapezoid, and oval. Your hairstyle options that will complement various facial shapes will include the oval face, so it looks good with almost any style, length, texture. Okay, but they benefit from angularity or masculine appearance. A round shaped face benefits from added height. Um, a square shaped face benefits from added height on the top and narrowness at the sides. An oblong shaped face, they'll benefit from width at the sides. A pear-shaped face will benefit from an added volume above the jawline and into the narrow areas of the upper crest area. In a diamond-shaped face, benefit from width in the upper portions, longer fringe, or layers. And the heart-shaped face will benefit from longer lengths, partially falling over the front hairline to avoid wide-looking foreheads. And then you have the seven clothing styles that we went through, right? Okay, you have to consider that when you're making a design decision for your clients. So, casual and easygoing. Give me one trait that I said today about the casual and easygoing client. I'm not going to pick the answer this time, you are. <laughs> we just went through it. So give me one trait about the casual or easygoing client. Give you a hint. Where's huh? ripped jeans? What was it? I said, where's ripped jeans? 
I think. <laughs> yeah, they wear blue jeans. <laughs> okay. Um, how about the natural explorer? One trait. Okay, I'll give you one and you come up with one, all right? They like natural or neutral colors. What was that, Miss Jamie? I didn't catch that. Give me one trait, okay, about the natural explore type of style. And I said, I give you one that's called natural. They like neutrals and natural colors. Okay. Nice updos. What was it? Nice updos. Nice updos. Is that what you said? Nice updos. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you very well. <laughs> Yeah, like nice, um, nice like hairstyles. Yeah, pretty. like a pompadour. Um, no, they're more like um, a sporty kind of tech guy. That type of a clientele. They're um, they care about the environment. I guess you could say that's the type of person a natural explorer. Then they have it like short. Yep, they have like ponytail. Ponytails. I don't know about no. Well, I don't remember anything about a ponytail, but I do know that they have low maintenance in their styles, okay? They don't require any product that they want in there. Okay, that's the type of plant that that is. Does that make sense now? Oh. Okay, how about that? Huh? <laughs> yeah, that works. How about traditional corporate? That one would have been like, wears a suit and tie. Their hairstyle is like, clean cut and tapered, right? Um, it's always groomed really well, right? Because they're they're walking around with the $10,000 suit on. <laughs> How about the urban? The urban look. Aren't they not afraid to like try new styles? Yep, that's true. They're not afraid. They like to be on the cutting edge. <laughs> Okay, they like the distressed jeans and denims and sweatpants and stuff like that. Good. Okay, there are six lifestyle factors to consider when you're making design decisions for your clients. Do you remember what? Give me one of those that we talked about. Okay, and it was the last thing I just said. Uh, is it having children and like if they're really, if they care about what like, their family thinks? Yes, right. It actually goes through job, career, their hobbies, their families, yeah. The time available, their finances, and their hair care skills. That's what all of that is. So it's good. I know it's almost two. So um, I'll give you the ones that are on here. Like Ms. Connie said, don't, don't leave if you're going to stay on unless you're going to just go completely. We don't want you logging off and logging back in, in other words. But I'm going to give you the ones that are here. I'll give you like another 10 minutes right now, okay? If you're going to leave, then you can leave for the day. But if you're going to stay, you've got leave your cameras on and just come back in 10. Okay. And we'll let people in. Okay. All right. Okay.
two point. Hi guys. Okay, let me get your names in here that that just came in. Okay. Dang, that was ten minutes. Huh? That was ten minutes. No, 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 no. If you were already here, yeah, you're fine. I'm letting in the new ones. Oh, oh, oh I see. Okay. okay. <laughs> like, no, no, no. <laughs> Can't possibly be. <laughs> Uh, I believe it. Those 10 minutes go by quick. They do, don't they? And I wasn't able to do anything with them. I mean, I shouldn't have taken it up to like 2 o'clock, but I did. Sometimes you have to tell me, shut up. It's time for break. Okay. Seriously. Because I can't see the um, time if I'm not paying attention to it. Okay, Alicia and Melissa. Who do I say? Alicia, and who's the last one I just let in? Who did I just let in? <laughs> Alicia and someone else. Yeah, it was me. And Alicia. Then, and somebody else. Amanda, I think. Did I just let you in? Yeah. And me. On here too. Okay, gotcha. Because I have to write you down as I log you, log you in, and I'm not used to your names yet, so. Connie's like, you got to get nice other names. I'm like, uh, oh. all right. Somebody said a chat. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm trying to let you guys in as quickly as I see you. You know what I mean? But if I miss you occasionally, don't get upset. Holler at somebody else and they'll tell me that's in the room. <laughs> that's the best I can do. <laughs> oh, what's that noise? They're bad, huh? Okay, and all right. Okay. Okay, where did I put her? I wish we would just go right to the top, okay? Instead of me having to search the whole screen for you guys. <laughs> All right, so what time is it? It is still um, 2.04, so we still got, those of you that just got logged on, my mouth kept running, so um, <laughs> I gave them a little 10 minute break, so I just don't want you logging back off once you've logged in here. They were already on for the hour, so I gave them their little break. Okay, now I need to switch books real quick.
So did you have a lot of work yesterday to do for homework? Anybody? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, Amanda, did I not let you in already? Did I not let you in once, <laughs> Amanda? <laughs> No, you did. I was just switching to my iPad. Okay. Is your um is is lab on yet? Are you guys on to lab yet at all? No. You guys are all ROP, right? Most of you. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have lab. Pivot point, people. Have you logged on to lab? recently like within the last five minutes ten minutes no okay let me see if i can log on yet then i can show slides i think i'm not sure <laughs> uh. miss jamie you're gonna really hate me but <laughs> my phone's gonna what? die what my cellular device is gonna die hey miss jamie oh, lab is still down Where's your charger? It's at the house. Where are you? In Merced. Why are you there? You go up to the liquor store and get you a charger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a broke I'm a broke um person right now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was about to say the H word. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, you're on char you're on record. Okay. <laughs> That's why I put on myself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to see if I can pull the slide up here. That's beauty. Yeah, that's what I want. No, it doesn't look like it. Nope. We're closed. Nice. I thought it was just, you know, for the internet was down that day. It looks like they're closed. Okay. All right. Is this gonna be our, our students? We got like, it's 207, I got three minutes left for them in here. Okay, those of you that just logged on. All right, we're gonna be starting with chapter nine, the sculpture. This is where Connie started yesterday. I, apparently she didn't start on the chapter yet. She was talking about different things, I guess something on the internet. It's all the information she gave me. <laughs> so we're gonna go again, old school with your notes. So you're going to have to take notes if you're not used to that yet. Um, I'm gonna ask that if the recording goes off on your screen, would you please speak up and tell me that it's off because I may not catch it in time. And so I need to keep the recording going. So if it, if it goes off by accident, just say, hey, the recording stopped so I can start it back up again. I went through a whole entire class without it going back on and no one said anything and it was like, they really didn't say anything to me until today and i'm like why did somebody say anything they're like i didn't know that you really needed to know i'm like yeah i kind of do mine's up in a tall corner up here but when i start lecturing and reading to you guys then it's like i can't see it at the same time so i'm asking you guys to notify me if the recording stops okay all right so do you have your books out most of you judith are you cooking? Are you cooking? <laughs> you have to cook for everybody, okay? We're all hungry. <laughs> yeah, I'm cooking. Like, you everybody. Like, someone used to bring food into the school, and like, you have to bring it for everybody, okay? <laughs> you can't just bring it for yourselves. <laughs> all right. So the rest of them should be coming in here like one minute, okay? And then I can start. Make this one a little bit easier. Okay. It's like 10, 9, 8, 7. I've got all these cameras up and there's no faces on them. So I gotta have faces on them. I think start coming in, trickling here. Okay. Yeah, there they are. You guys have a nice day, don't you, during the day? You don't have anything until like 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Come on. It's gonna be nice. Max, I can't see your face. Okay, that, Alicia, I need to see your face. There we go. Everybody's back on. Good. Okay, 
I'm gonna do a roll call just really quick. If your name isn't called, then let me know, okay? So I'm gonna use part of what's here from the first class. All right, Elizabeth, Leslie, Isabella, Alejandro, Ashley, Junior, he just left, okay? <laughs> Jasmine, Judith, Max, Sandra, Trace, Valerie, Shay, Alyssa, Vanessa, Nick, Jessica, Brenda, Kayla, Carly, Leslie, Ashley, Caitlin, Deja, Kayla again, Ashley, Los Mon, I don't know how to say this, and she's still in here, let me look. Um, it's Los, M-O-N, looks like she's gone. Okay, so I don't have to worry. Oh no. That's Los me still. Okay, yeah, all right. That's you, all right. And yeah. I'm gonna butcher this name too, so I'm just gonna spell it. No, it's it's because I changed my device and say it was dying earlier. But T R I A J E H I can't pronounce that name, I'm sorry. Taraja. Taraja. Okay, thank you. And then um was this Cassandra Pina or what was your first name? Her last name was Pina, I think. Yeah, yeah, Cassandra Pina. Okay, that's what I want to make sure. Okay, and then Amanda, Eva or Ava, Alyssa, another Amanda, and Nadia. So did I forget anyone? Okay, I know Eva just now. Um, you forgot my name. Who was that? They just said I forgot um, the name. Hello? Uh oh, please don't leave me. Okay. Who who just said that I didn't call the name? You didn't call Siklali. Okay. Where are you on my screen here? I'm like trying to find what's your last name? My Blanco. Oh, okay. Yes, okay, yeah, you're on my list. I just couldn't pronounce your name earlier, so I'm so sorry. No, you you're good, thank you. Okay, no, you were on there. I'm like, oh my God, I can't pronounce your name. <laughs> okay, good. Did you call my name? And you are? Haley. Haley? Um, no, I don't think I did. Haley? Yeah. Eight, right? Okay, we're, I'm looking for you right now. <laughs> What's your last name, hon? Santos. I've been here since one. Okay. Um, this yeah, you're right here on the site. Okay. Hi, you here. forgot about me too. Um, okay. At first, my name was marked as Sandra because okay. it was switched on this device, uh -huh. but I've been here since one. Okay, and what's your name now? Because I can't. Jocelyn? Jocelyn um, Ruiz. Okay, I'm looking right now. Uh. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Anybody else? You didn't call Natalie. Natalie, okay. And Natalie, oh, okay, Lopez, all right. Okay, so everyone else have called, right? Um, I'm not sure if you got my name already. Who are, who's talking now? Melissa? Um, uh, Melissa. Um, that's right here. Because there was a couple I let in this before when we first started and I didn't get their names, I'm so sorry. Connie goes, you'll get the name. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so everybody should be on my list now, right? All right. Oh, no. no I got Kayla. Again. Did you get right. me? Um, who said me? Alicia? Rubio? Yeah. Okay, just okay. making sure. Yeah. Yes, I got you. Okay, so everybody else, we've gotten hold of, okay? All right. So we're going to do hair sculpting, right? So the definition of hair sculpting is the artistic carving or removing of hair lengths to create various forms or shapes, okay? So there are three basic observations for hair sculpture, sculpt, sculpture analysis, and they're known as basic detail and abstract. And it's to help you view the design from various perspectives, pretty much. Okay. I know. <laughs> okay, basic. Okay. 
This is identify the basic form or shape by simply observing the outer boundary or silhouette, which is known as your form line. Okay. So outer I'm trying to cover most of the things that I know are test questions. Okay. And form line is one of your definitions for your test questions because they come from your vocab words. So <laughs> detail, this is when you identify the detail in the texture or the surface appearance. Okay. Then you have abstract and the hair is viewed as if it was standing straight out from the head in order to identify its structure and how it was created. So kind of looking at it in different parts, I guess you could say. Shape is the design. It's analyzed by using the silhouette only. Oh, okay, hold on. Someone else is in. Where did she go? Chaclet. Where did she go? Chaclet. Where are you? What happened? Hold on. Jacquelette, can you talk to me? Okay. If you get bounced in the room, I need you to, you know, answer me what I'm talking to at first so I can figure out. I don't have her last name. Jacquelette, are you in the room? There you are. Nope. Okay. Don't see her. Okay. Okay. Our next word is we have texture, right? We're looking at the surface appearance to determine whether the whatever type it is. There are two types of texture. Okay. There's unactivated, and this means that the hair is going to be smooth. There's no unbroken lines on the the surface of the hair and then activated texture which means they're broken lines with exposed ends so it kind of be like layers that you can see okay so unactivated is going to be smooth and activated is going to be exposed ends <clears throat> those are both test questions the structure this is the arrangement of lengths across various curves of the head Okay, the arrangement of lengths across various curves of the head. All right, a structured graphic is a <laughs> diagram that provides an abstract view of the length arrangement to scale and proportion. Basically, it's a blueprint of your final sculpturing design. Okay. Um, there are two ways to analyze this, that structure, okay? The first is for natural fall, okay? And natural fall describes the hair as it lays naturally over the curves of the head. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. It allows an analysis of the surface appearance, okay? The texture of the hair, the direction it's going. Okay, and it also describes the length or level to which the hair falls on like your earlobe, your chin, or your neck. Then you have normal projection, which describes the hair as it's viewed as if it was sticking straight up from the head. Sticking your finger into a light socket and it comes out like this, that's normal projection because it's projected straight up from the head, right from the curve of the head. Okay, it allows a view of abstract representation and gives the ability to duplicate any design. If you're going to check a haircut, you're going to be pulling it up like this, okay? You're going to look to where the angles are, where it's been cut previously. So you will check the normal projection on it. The natural fall is going to give you the length, basically, of what you're coming across. We have four basic forms that we use when we're cutting. Believe it or not, these are the main haircuts that you will learn to do and every haircut is a combination of these. All right, so four basic forms when they're used alone or in any combination, they'll make up every hair design there ever is or ever was or ever will be. <laughs> All right, so your first one is going to be a solid form, okay? It's also known as, okay, a one length cut, um, a bob, a Dutch boy, and I know you're gonna ask what's a Dutch boy. 
you guys know what a Dutch boy is? You ever seen a can of paint with that little boy and he's got the little painter's hat on? He's got like bangs across here and his head's cut straight up right here. That's basically a Dutch boy. It's just a one length haircut. Okay, it's also known as a blunt cut, okay? Or a zero degree angle cut, okay? So you have one length cut, a bob, a Dutch boy, a blunt cut, or a zero degree angle because we're not lifting it at all. So it's gonna be zero projection. Its structure is basically shorter exterior progressing to longer interior. So shorter underneath, longer on the outside. The weight, it develops the maximum weight of any haircut, okay? Because it's one length. Its shape is going to be a rectangle and its texture is going to be unactivated. So you have shorter exterior progressing to longer interior, maximum weight, its shape is gonna be a rectangle, and its texture is gonna be unactivated. Okay, that is your solid form. So they're always gonna ask you, solid form is also known as, and you're gonna go, a zero degree cut, also known as that form. All right, your next form is going to be a graduated form, okay? And this is also known as a wedge, okay? Or a 45 degree angle. It's usually used like right on the sides of the head, the back of the head, and the nape. Its structure is going to be shorter exterior, gradually progressing to longer interior. Shorter exterior, going to progressively longer interior. All right, its weight, this is found above the perimeter for form line. Okay, it's above the perimeter form line. Its shape is going to be a triangle and its texture is gonna be unactivated or activated, so it can be both. Because it's gonna have a little bit of layering and then it's gonna have a solid line. Make sense? Okay. Your third one is going to be known as the increased layered form. And this is also known as a shag, a, lay a long layer cut basically, or a 180 degree angle cut. Okay. A shag, long layers, 100 degree 80 angle cut. Okay. Its structure is going to be shorter interior, progressing to longer exterior. Shorter interior, progressing to longer. Good night, hon. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. To longer exterior. All right. Its weight, there's no concentration of weight okay, at all. Its shape is going to be oval and its texture is going to be activated. Okay. The graduated is the shorter exterior and then the increased layer is the shorter interior. Okay, on the graduated, it's shorter exterior progressing to longer interior because the top part's longer and the ends are shorter. That's why they're saying shorter exterior, longer up here. Now the increased layer is going to be shorter interior, okay, progressively to longer exterior. All right, so it's gonna start short up here and then it's gonna go gradually longer. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Because you're going to basically, the haircut literally is taking it from the very back length and drawing it all the way up to the top and cutting it off like right by here. But you can have different angles at it, but that's basically what you're doing. So the hair is longer in the back and shorter on the top. All right. Your fourth one is going to be the uniform layered cut, which is your state board haircut. Okay. It's also known as a layered cut or 90 degree angle. Okay. A layered cut or 90 degree angle. 
And I tell you state board cut because that's what you have to do for state board. <laughs> Except for you, Nick, if you're still in here, you're not going to do a state, the state board haircut. This is for the Cosmos. Its structure is the same length throughout. You know you've done this haircut right when you can put, because your comb has like six inches on it. Let's just say you choose four inches. If you take it and lay the comb on the scalp this way and you go out four inches, no matter where you put that comb, it's going to be four inches all over the head. Okay? It's weight, there's no concentration of weight because it's like all the way around the head, it's layered. Its shape is gonna be circular, okay? And it's gonna be activated texture. So 90 degree would be like four inches all over the head or five inches all over the head. It's gonna be the same length no matter where you put that comb. Okay, then we move into what's called graduated. Gradation, that's what it's called. G-R-A-D-A-T-I-O-N. Okay. And this is shorter exterior lengths, gradually progressing to longer interior lengths. So think of it as like a fade. It's going up short, okay? Gradation is just like a fade. Its structure is basically, it says same length, or excuse me, it doesn't have a one on here. It just gives you, Shorter exterior lengths to gradually progressing to longer interior lengths. It's usually combined with other forms. It's not just used by itself. Okay, let's put it that way. So it's a taper. Okay, and then you have one last one in here that's known as combination forms. And that's basically what most of your haircuts are going to be, okay? Because your combination form is two or more forms in any combination. So I can pick like, let's say I can pick the 45 degree haircut, okay? And then I can, on the 45, I can actually have one length and then I can have the 45 at an angle here. Or I can mix it with gradation and bring it up higher for that fade that goes up a little bit higher here, but it's one length on the top. So it just depends on what type of a haircut you're going to do. You should be able to look at the haircut and see how it's cut. If not, you're going to pick that hair up and you're going to check to see what angles it's been taken at. And you can see how it was cut. Honest to God, it's kind of weird how it works, but it, it truly does. Okay. So you can use, here's like a couple of combinations that they can use. You can use one that's called an increase, layered, and a solid. Okay, this is going to be totally activated surface appearance with the maximum perimeter weight. Okay, because you're going to have that increase and then all of a sudden it's going to be one length. You can have an increase graduated. This is also a combination form. Okay, it expands the form and produces evident weight area where the two structures will meet. Um, uniform graduated. Okay, the lengths can be blended for a totally activated surface texture. Because uniform is gonna be 90 degrees, correct? Say I do 90 degrees and I do a graduated, so that means everything from the nape or like right at the mid ear going down is going to be tapered. Um, you have a uniform increase, okay? This is a highly activated surface and it's elongation towards the perimeter. So it's going to be Uniformed at one point, it's kind of, this sounds terrible, I hate to say this. It kind of reminds me of, I, don't, I can't even think of this guy. Um, Miley Cyrus's dad, what was that haircut that he wore where it was short on the top and long in the back? That's exactly what we're talking about when we say uniform increase, okay? He had it short here and then it was just long hanging in the back. I forgot the Amalek. name of it. Amalek, yes. I don't know why I couldn't think of that at the time. I'm like, I can't think of that name. Yeah, it's Amalek. Okay, so you're understanding how, how these haircuts work, right, together? All right, then you have one that you can use increase and uniform and gradation at the same. Okay, so the height and the fullness will be at the fringe and there's a close fitting contour at the exterior. All right, um, and the last one they can give you as an example would be square linear 
and the weight area is created when the increased layering meets the graduated form. Okay, so it would be kind of like a boxed cut on a gentleman. Okay, it's also known as a planar, planar haircut, but it's a little bit uniformed here in this box area here, and then it fades really close to the skin here. So those are the different types of haircuts that we can actually give our clients. Now weight generally means a concentration of length in one given area. Okay, let's go into um, your sculpting tools. Okay, we all know that we have our shears, right? So sculpting tools are the handheld tools that we use for sculpting hair, which means cutting, okay? And they require disinfection after every use. The shears are also known as what we call straight shears. Okay, that's their name. Their characteristics are two straight blades. Their primary use is to give you a blunt, clean edge. Okay. And now we're going to go into the parts of the shear. Okay, I need to get a pair of shears here. Hold on, I have a pair in my purse. Just <laughs> have Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't know I was going to be going through this, this part of it. But I'm going to get you a pair of shoes too. I can't just use a regular pair of shoes because I wouldn't be able to, to show you anything. But I can show you these. Here we go. All right. So everyone can see my little shears here, right? All right. Turning it this way, okay? All right. So this right here is going to be your finger bra brace, that little tang right here, right? And your finger grip is going to be right here. So your little finger is going to go into here. And then your baby finger is going to rest on that tang. This is your thumb grip right here, okay? This little screw right here is known as the tension hand screw. So by tightening that, it's going to make those blades a little bit tighter. Okay, the bottom blade is your movable blade. Excuse me, here we go. And this one is your steel blade, okay? So you're always moving. Hey, Ms. Jenny, you're gonna need to move the scissors up, you can see. Okay, how about now, can you see now? Yeah, no? Yeah, you can see it now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm like down like this, right? Going, do you see this? Okay. So um, ah, this area right here is known as the shank. Okay, right there. Can you see that right here? Okay. So we've kind of gone through the actual pieces of the shears. All right, how you hold the shears and your comb. You're going to insert your ring finger like right there, okay, <laughs> to control the still blade. And then the thumb is gonna be the movable blade. You see how I'm moving it like this? You're gonna, this is how you're going to remove them to hold them when you're cutting. You're gonna take your thumb out, okay, and you're going to palm the shear, all right? When you're in a classroom situation, literally, I hold these up in the air like this, and I have my back towards the class and I'm showing them how they're supposed to do it. So they're gonna stick their thumb in the blade or in that thumb grip. You're going to move the shear this way. You're gonna remove your thumb, palm your shear. Okay, this is how you remove it. So, finding my comb. Your comb and your shears are gonna be basically in the same hand. You're going to comb the hair. This is gonna go into here. You're gonna pull the hair this way. Comb goes here and then you're going to cut. Okay, so it's comb, it's a lot easier in a classroom. You're gonna comb the hair, all right? The comb goes into this hand, you still have this bait, and you're gonna use this to cut. 
It's weird, huh? <laughs> we'll cover this tomorrow when you're in class, but I just needed to go through it in your workbook. Okay. All right. An alternate method of that palming that shear is to rest the shears on the outside of your palm, but we're not going to go through that right now. Okay. Because it basically needs to be done in a classroom situation. Okay. But you have to be able to hold the shears and the comb in the same hand. Okay. And it, it gets kind of awkward when you first learned how to cut. You have positions to use for sculpting. Okay. You're going to have a palm down, a palm up, a palm to palm or on top of the fingers. Okay, so palm down basically means that my palms are down this way and I'm like cutting across a bang, let's say, okay? When I'm doing palm up, I'm gonna be pulling the hair this way, my hand turns this way and I'm going to cut, okay? Palm to palm, I'm going to pull it out this way vertically, okay? And I'm going to cut like this, okay? And then I have one when I'm pulling straight up, okay, and I'm cutting that way. So again, these three or four different styles are going to be used in the classroom when you get here tomorrow. She'll have to show you how to do hold the comb. Did she go through that already with you guys at all on hair cutting? Any of you? No one's answered me at all. You have no clue what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> That's okay. I just need to know. I have. Okay. Anyone else have hair cutting? No? Okay. Well, these are just your notes for right now, okay? All right. Um, what do you, do you know what you're gonna be doing tomorrow in class at all? Any of you? No, she didn't let us know. Okay, have you been working on wet sets? What, what did you do last week when you were here at school? Or yesterday, what did you do? Or not yesterday, last week, sorry, last Saturday? What were you doing in class? No one remembers? The ROPs, we don't go into the school. So At all? Okay. No, we're just on Zoom Tuesdays and Wednesdays okay. and then we just do our packet. All right, so the, then the Pivot Point students, what have you been working on when you come in? For floor, we've been doing um, just anything that we need. We just been working we have on left. You just working on anything that you need to catch up on? Yeah, which is what Yeah, I've been doing like hair design okay, stuff. So, so the pivot point already know how to do the hair cutting part, right? Not not everybody. Okay. The new who's saying not everybody? Is that you, Alejandra? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So yeah, you're new in the barber end of that. Okay. So I, I get that part. Okay. Um the ROPs, are you brand speaking new? And you're still on theory, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to get a feel of what I thought everybody was already coming back to the school. That's why I was confused. Okay. If you've never had hair cutting whatsoever, this is just your. I have a question. Uh huh. Your theory part. Do of you it. know when? Um. So so some of the ROPs are already going back. Uh huh. Um. Do you know when? Like uh, because I was an ROP. But like I graduated high school, so do you know possibly like for like about when we're going back? Um, I thought you guys were going to be coming back really soon. Are you've already been here? Like yeah, I've I've been there okay. for like um, I don't know how long, like seven months maybe. You know what? I, I was will, I will find out exactly when because I thought it was really close. Okay. All right. All right. So um, I'll give you guys a little break here in about. 10, 15 minutes, okay? And then I'll go find out and give you an answer, okay? All right? So now we're just, basically what we're doing now is just our workbook on, on the different parts of the hair cutting tools. Um, the next part, so just take notes on this. That's the best I can give you, okay? You will be practicing what I just did with my hands when you're in here at the school, okay? Um, your next tool is going to be a taper shear. Um, I actually have one of those too. Did have right here. Embarrassing. Okay, here we go. Kind of looks like this. It's got teeth on one side, okay, and it's got a blade on the other side. So it's known as one straight blade and one notched blade. Kind of looks like a comb, okay? 
and they also call it serrated, all right? The serrated blade holds the hair inside when you go to cut, okay? What it does is it creates shorter lengths within the form. So if I have a straight form and I wanna give it some texture, okay? I don't want it to be straight, but I want it to have some type of, you know, little short and long pieces. I can use this on the end because it won't cut it completely straight. It'll cut every other hair, every fourth hair, depending on how many teeth are involved in here. Because some of them will be a lot wider. Ugh. They'll be like, instead of being like a comb right here, it will be like one notch here, a notch here, a notch here. It just depends on how many teeth are in there. The more teeth, the more hair that comes out of it. Okay? So it's there to actually help you take out a lot of bulk, I guess you could say and it can texturize the ends for you. So if I was trying to blend a, a haircut, say if I was doing even a barber's haircut where I was trying to, to blend that fade going up and I had some little spots, I can still use those shears to try and blend that a little bit better. So there is one that's called a taper eight, okay? And it's an eighth of an inch apart. It's a slightly tapered effect, if that's what you're looking for. There's a taper 16, okay? And this is 1 16th apart. And this will remove a medium amount of hair, okay? And then I have one that's the 32 teeth, okay? And this is gonna be the maximum hair removal, and it's used in highly texturized effects. This one's a 1 32 of an inch. So you have a teeth eight, okay? Taper eight teeth, 1 eighth of an inch, you have a taper 16th teeth, which is 1 16th, and you have a taper 32 teeth, which is a 1 over 32, okay? So then they have these other ones that are called channeling shears, which are wider notches that produce um, a chunkier dramatic effect. So it's blade, let's say if I was gonna have it here, I would have a little teeth mark here, and then one right here, and then one right here. So there'd be a big gap between them. That's what your channeling shears are, okay? So these are your sculpting tools. You also have a razor, okay? And the razor may be used to sculpt the entire head, or you can use it to texturize, okay, within the form. And this is basically one straight blade, okay? And you're using a razor. This razor, Alejandro, is not the same as the razor you use for shaving, okay? <laughs> Just so that you know, all right? Okay. All right. And I don't have that little piece here, so I can't really go through it right now. <laughs> but when you're sculpting with a razor, it's essential that the hair always be damp. You don't want to cut it when it's wet. I mean, dry, excuse me. And you don't want to um, try it all, because what it does is it pulls on the hair, kind of rips it, okay? So the hair always has to be wet when you're doing a razor cut. Um, let's move into your clippers, okay? The characteristics of a clipper would be known as a clipper blade and the attachments. And we all know there's quite a few different attachments depending on how short or long you want the hair to be. The clippers will move in a side-to-side -side motion as they will sculpt the hair. Um, when you're holding the, the clippers, you're gonna hold the palm over the clippers and position your thumb on the side of the clippers, okay? There's an alternate position where your thumb is on top of the clippers and position the remaining fingers underneath the clippers. <laughs> There's a couple of different ways to hold it, but again, these will have to be done in your classroom. You're never gonna use a clipper blade that has broken teeth, and you always wanna make sure that your blades are aligned properly, okay? Don't try to take apart a blade because you know what you're doing because let me tell you the best of us can't get those blades on right the right time or the first time we're doing it seriously i still can't i just take it to a professional and let them handle changing the blades all right the combs that we use okay we have various comb sizes and shapes that are used to control the hair we use <laughs> combs to detangle wet hair and we use brushes to comb or to brush dry hair. All right, so when you shampoo, you're gonna detangle the wet hair in preparation for your hair sculpture, okay? 
There's a column that's called a master sketcher. Okay, it's used to control and distribute larger amounts of hair. It's also used for clipper over comb or shear over comb techniques. Okay, so it can be wider at one end and tapered at the other end. We have a sculpting, um, your sculpting comb, which is similar to this one right here. Okay, you have one just as similar, it's a little bit smaller than this, okay, that you can use for cutting. Okay, only yours is gonna have little notches here. There'll be one every inch, we have like seven inches as a comb, and it has seven little numbers on there. All right, moving on to the seven procedures. In order to do a haircut, you have to go through these seven steps, okay? They're called sculpting, seven procedures of sculpting. All right, the first one is we want to section the hair. So we're gonna section the hair into our little groups, whether it's a section it into four, section it into eight, whichever number that you're going to use. The second, is to position the head in the way that you want to cut it. The third is to part that hair. The fourth one is to distribute the hair. The fifth is to project it. Sixth, you're checking pos position of your finger in your shears. And the seventh is your sculpting design line, which is your first cut. So section, position the head, part, distribute, project, position your fingers and shears, and sculpt the design line. Okay, so let's break them down, all right? Sectioning. Every successful hair sculptor begins with sectioning. You do not just cut a head of hair without sectioning, okay? Trust me, even the best of us can't do that. Not do it right or have it even, all right? Sectioning involves dividing the hair into workable areas for the purpose of control, okay? Take smaller sections so that you can see clearly where your guidelines are. All right, the number of sections and types of sectioning patterns depend on the type of hair sculpture being created. So, do you guys happen to have your books with you or your book at all? None of you? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go. You have your book? Okay, so we should be on like 246 in your workbook. Do you have a workbook here? Yeah. I don't think that the ROP have workbooks though, but you do. Okay, we're gonna look at the reference points of the head and label the points of the head using this. Wait a script. minute, you said page 246? Yeah, in your study guide. It'll be 286 in your textbook. Oh, in the study guide. Hold on. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Page 245 in the study guide says sculpting tools. Okay. It might, might be a different page on yours than mine, okay? Because I might have an older version of the text, okay? Should be, um, is it 286 and 287 in your workbook? I mean, in your textbook, okay? Okay, hold on one second. What, what am I? 286 in the textbook um, says increase layer from haircut. Okay, in your... Oh, we all have different books, then. Yeah. This is Pivot Point 7 Sculpting Procedures on my 286. Okay. 246 in the study guide, it looks like this, okay? And it's 286 in your textbook. Yeah, the textbook, yes, but in the... In this, it's not the same? Oh, this right here? Is this what you're looking at? Yeah. Well, yeah, sort of. Are you down to where it says the reference points underneath the seven sculpting? It should have um, the seven procedures, right? And then it should say section one and it breaks it down. No. 
No? Hmm. What chapter is this? 9.3? Yeah, it's 9.3. I don't know. This is what it what it looks like. That's totally different, huh? Okay. Reference points on like where the top is, where the fringe is, where the interior crest area. Do you see that area in your book? I'm looking through these different pages. No. No. This is all talking about projection for increased layer forms. Okay, we went past that part. Okay. We're past this, so maybe it's the next one. Oh. The part where it says sectioning. No, because the next one is chapter 10 and it says hair design theory. Wow. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where you're at, where that is that you just showed me. Um, I did yeah, it has um, four types of distribution, natural, perpendicular, shifted, directional. That's the stuff that's on my 9.3. Okay, and that's, and we went past that area. Um, we're basically going into, um, look at where it says positioning the head. Does it go through that? Does it tell you anything about that? No, it goes from position of finger and shears, texture categories, comb control, short hair techniques. It doesn't say anything about position in the head. Then after that, it goes into chapter 10, hair design. So here's what we're gonna do, okay? There's seven procedures that we have to go through, okay? And I'm gonna have you write these down, but we're gonna break them down on top of it. So leave a couple of lines so I can give you some information to put in there, okay? So our first one was on sectioning, right? Okay, what you're gonna write there is it, it involves dividing the hair into workable areas for the purpose of control. That's why we section, okay? It's basically it's definition, okay? So it's dividing the hair into workable areas for the purpose of control. Okay. All right, you ready to move on yet? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Did I lose her? Who was I just talking to? Me, Trees. Okay. I'm like trying to find you on my. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the beginning of the book here because I'm trying to look in the table of contents to see like where it is in my study guide. Should be on the same page. That's so odd. It is very odd. Okay. Did you write down what I told you on the sectioning? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to go to number two, and that's like the position of the head. Okay. And it basically means how the head is positioned while you're trying to cut someone's head. Okay. So if you want to put it as the head position directly influences the fall of the hair. The head position. Just put it influences the fall of the hair. And there are three positions that we use, okay? When we're cutting someone's hair, we have them in the upright position like this, okay? They're sitting straight up so we can see how the hair is going to lay, all right? So you can consider it, we call it pure results because it doesn't matter what it is, it's gonna look the best and it's gonna look how it's supposed to look in the upright position, right? Okay, the other one is called forward, where we tilt the head forward, okay? So I can get shorter lengths in the nape. All right? And here's a story that'll make you laugh, okay? I don't know why this happened every single time I did a male client. 
I would say, tilt forward and they would do this, head go back like this. And I'm like, why are you tilting your head back? Finally, I had to ask them, I'm like, why are you putting your head back? And they're like, because you said tilt forward. And I'm like, forward, okay? Meaning you go forward. And he goes, oh, I thought you wanted me to tilt towards you. And I'm like, no. So when I'm doing a male haircut, every single time I have to go tilt forward and I push their head just a little bit forward so they know which direction they're supposed to go. It's the weirdest thing. Okay, so forward is gonna give me shorter lengths in the knee, okay, and longer on the surface, all right? Now tilted is our third one, okay? And tilted is used to refine like around the ear. So if I tilt their head to the side, I can cut around their ear. Remember, you wanna move their head in the easiest way for you to do this haircut because you shouldn't have to be all contorted trying to give a haircut because if you do you'll never be working for very long you'll be all tensed up and kink necks and all that kind of stuff so they can move their head whatever way they want you want them to they can be in the upright position okay they can be tilted forward or they can be tilted to the side okay these are all things that they can do for you i've even had a client because i can cut one side of the head like around the ear very easily but the other side it's like I have to hold it down. And so it's kind of hard to hold it down and then hold their skin down. So I would say, will you hold your ear down like this? Or I'll take their hand and go, let me have your hand. And I'll put it like this and I'll show them, hold this down so I can cut around it. Because they would rather have an even straight haircut than you have a crooked haircut because you were afraid to ask them. Trust me, okay? It only takes a minute to say, can you hold your ear down for me so I can get around that one side? Because it's usually one side that's a little awkward for you to get around. It's not a big deal for them. They don't care. They want a good haircut. <laughs> All right. So number three now is gonna be parting, all right? Because we did one for sectioning, two for the position of the head, right? Okay, and the third one's gonna be parting, okay? And partings are lines that subdivide sections, okay? Lines, partings are lines that subdivide sections. So we can control the hair. Can you repeat that, please? Okay. Partings are lines that subdivide sections of hair for control. Okay, because remember we sectioned it off into four, right? And now we've got to give it partings so that we can get in there, all right? So partings are lines that subdivide sections of hair in order to control. And there are basically six common parting lines that we use, okay? So I'm gonna give you those six parting lines. We have a horizontal part, okay, that's one. We have a vertical part, that's two. Okay. We have a diagonal back and a diagonal forward. Okay, so you have diagonal back, diagonal forward. and you have concave and convex. So those are the six common parting lines. Now, have you heard of the celestial axis? Anyone? Okay, it basically looks like this, and I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna start off with just four lines okay like this can you guys see this right here whoops wrong side right here this side right there we're on the wrong side this side right here <laughs> sorry i can't see okay right here that four and what it basically means is everything can connect to it so i'm going to show you how i connect i can do this and i can do this all right did you see how i connect uh, those lines okay right over here yeah all right, now I'm going to do it again on the other two lines, one and two, like that. Okay, it looks like where I can't see. There we go. It looks like that. I'm not a very good drawer, okay? All right, and what you're doing is connecting all of this so those lines can connect to this one. And it actually looks so cool because it ends up looking like this. But it's inside the circles. Anyway, wrong side, there we go, like this. Um, that one right there, okay? But you're connecting each line. 
And basically what you're doing when you're doing a haircut is you're actually connecting lines together, okay? You take your first cut and let's say you cut right here. Well, you've got to connect both these sides still, right? You've got to give it some type of form so you have to connect them. So when we cut a head of hair, wherever you start, you've got to come back to that starting position to make sure it's even, all right? I'm gonna give you guys a little break. You got 10 minutes, okay? And then um, we'll come back in here and finish up this lecture, all right? And Therese, I'm gonna figure out what's going on here. <laughs> All right. So you got 10 minutes, okay? Thank you. All right, no problem.
Hey, Leslie, um, when you get off, can you send me the homework for today? Because I have to get off. Hey. Sue. Hi, everyone. You coming back? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, Jacqueline.
Everybody here? Okay, the ROPs, I found out what about that, okay? The ROPs are gonna come back for a couple weeks and then you're, they're gonna bring you back. What we've done is bring in a little bit at a time and make sure that there's no incidences and then bring back a little bit more, okay? Cause there's a lot of people here, <laughs> all right? So we're bringing in each department slowly and letting it go for like a week or two we're making sure that nobody's sick, nobody's getting COVID and all that kind of stuff before we bring in the next group. Okay. So that so you guys got a couple of weeks on the ROPs, all right? Okay. All right. So let's go back to what we were doing before break. Okay. And I was talking about. The parting lines, right? There's actually two more, okay, I'm gonna give you, but those are the main common parting lines, but you're gonna add concave lines and convex lines. Concave lines curve inward. I always think of concave like the inside of a cave, okay? Think of it that way. The textbook says it curves inward like the inside of a sphere, but I like to think of it as the inside of a cave because that's how, what a cave looks like, all right? Convex are going to be outward, like the outside of the sphere. So convex would look like this, okay? And then concave would be, or convex would be that way, concave would be this way, okay? So one's outside of the, she the sphere and one is inside. The concave goes this way, okay? Does that make sense to you guys? Convex and concave, okay. All right. The next sculpting tool out of those seven, right, is called distribute, okay? And basically this is distribution, how we distribute the hair, okay? It's combed in relation to its base parting, okay? And there are four types that we use, okay? The first one is, so under distribute, you're gonna put the direction the hair is combed in relation to its parting, okay? The direction the hair is combed in relation to its parting. Okay, that's what distribute means. Okay, and therefore you're going to have natural, you're going to have perpendicular, you're going to have shifted, and you're going to have directional. Okay, so let's start off with natural. Okay. Natural direction means the direction the hair assumes as it falls naturally. Okay, that's what natural distribution means. The okay, direction. Just real quick, just real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off, okay. but I found it. So what you're talking about right now is in the textbook. It's on page 288. Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. So I still haven't figured this one out yet. The study. Oh, it's like there's a weird page in yours, huh? Yeah, I got it in this book, though. All right. Do you come tomorrow to school? Yeah, I'll bring it. Yes. Okay, so I can figure that thing out. I don't know why it's so strange. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, did you get distributed what that means? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have, it, I have the book right here. Okay. Okay, good. So, you're filling in, too, basically, your workbook. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the direct it's the direction the hair assumes as it falls naturally. <clears throat> it's used when we use horizontal diagonal left or diagonal right partings. And it's primarily used when we do a solid haircut. That's what we're distributing the hair that way. Okay. So if you want to just put it in the direction the hair assumes as it falls naturally. Okay. And it's used to cut a solid form. Okay, that's the important part of it. Okay, then you have perpendicular distribution. Okay, and this means that the hair is combed at a 90 degree angle from its parting. Okay, and we use it like horizontally or we use it vertically, horizontally, but it's primarily used to cut graduated forms. Okay. 
So the hair is combed at a 90 degree angle from its parting. All right, then you have shifted distribution, okay? And the hair is combed out of natural fall, okay? In any direction except perpendicular. Okay, and it's used when you increase length, okay? So basically, I can pull it up this way. I'm shifting my angle is what we're talking about. So have you ever taken the length from the bottom and brought it up to the top, right? You shifted that angle or that parting. That's what they're talking about. So it's used when you need length increases or if you're trying to blend something. That's when you use the shifted distribution. Okay. That makes sense to you guys? I'm trying to make it as easy as possible because it used to get me so confused. I'm like, okay, show me what you're talking about here. <laughs> All right, and then your last one is going to be directional distribution, okay? This is where that celestial axis is used to visually gauge your distribution. But the hair is distributed in a vertical or, or horizontal or a diagonal direction, first of all, okay? Hair is distributed vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. It's used in a planar sculpting. Now, planar is straight out from the head and straight up from the head. Okay, that's the best way I can describe it. But it results in length increases due to the curve of the head. Okay, it results in length increases due to the curve of the head. Okay, I'm going to give you a little ex extra little thing in here, okay? That when you're doing planar sculpting, okay, it requires directional distribution and utilizes a technique in which the line is sculpted along horizontal and vertical planes. So that means I'm going to be pulling it up straight up like this, or I'm going to pull it straight out from the side, okay? And when you get to, it's like the, it's a box cut this way, okay? It's going to come out like this, and then this part's going to go up, so it looks like this. I forgot that boy's haircut that was like that, but it's straight up from the head and straight up from the top. And it looks like a square, the actual shape of it on the head. All right, the fifth element in there, in those, right? Because we did distribute was fourth, right? All right, the fifth one is projection, okay? And projection is also known as elevation. Only in, in to a point, they don't like to use the word elevation, so they call it projection, okay? But pro projection or elevation, okay, is the angle at which the hair is held in relation to the head, or the curve of the head, but it's the angle at which the hair is held, okay, in relation to the curve of the head. So if I was doing my planar, I would be pulling it straight out to here, and then I would be pulling this up. If I was doing a 90 degree, I would be going around, because the, the head's a curve like this, right? So I'm gonna do four inches out here, four inches here, four inches all around the curve of the head, okay? So that's what they're talking about, the angle I take when I'm going around the curve of the head, okay? And there are three of them, all right? The most common ones are zero, 45, and 90. Those are your most common projections. Low projection is zero to 30 degrees. Okay. Medium projection is gonna be 30 to 60 degrees. And high projection is gonna be 60 to 90 degrees, okay. Anything higher than that is going to be more or less like your gradation where it fades up really close to the head. Okay, zero projection basically means like a natural fall, okay? It's neither lifted away from the head or the scalp, okay? So zero, I'm gonna pull the head straight down to where it lays, right? And I haven't lifted it. If I lifted it out this way, I could lift it at 45, I could lift it at 90. 
right? As I'm, oh, sorry. As I'm pulling it out, zero means I'm gonna comb it straight down and I have not lifted it. If I lift it, I can lift it up a little bit this way. It could be 30 degrees. If I lift it up a little bit higher, it'd be 45. If I lift it up higher, do you see where I'm going with this? So it's basically telling you how close I'm lifting my angle. But I'm keeping it at zero, so it's gonna be just combed straight down. There's no part of it, okay? All right. So zero projection, I want you to put that in there. Zero projection or natural fall, it's neither lifted or moved towards the scalp, it's straight down, okay? And you have to be very careful when you're doing a zero degree haircut because a lot of people when they have hair longer than say right here where the drape is usually hitting or their shoulders are, okay? You have a tendency to lift out past that to comb that hair. You have to keep that as close to the body as possible in order to get that zero degree. Otherwise you're lifting up at elevations, okay? Which means those very ends are gonna have little stacked edges on the end of it. Okay, and that's great if you want the edges stacked, you want to layer them on the end. But if you don't, you want a zero degree, you've got to keep it close to the body without lifting it. Okay, then you have a projection for graduated form, okay? And this projection angle goes from zero or 90 degrees, but the standard is 45, okay? So projection, first we did for solid form, now we're gonna do for good graduation, or yeah, graduated form, okay? The first projected line will establish the inclination, like how high you're gonna lift it. The higher the projection of the angle, the greater the amount of graduated texture. Okay, or greater the line of inclination is what they call it. Okay, so the higher you pull it, the higher it's going to be tapered up. Okay, all right, your next form, okay, or your projection for increased layered is going to be zero, 45, or 90 degree. Okay, and this projection angle of a stationary design line is important because it establishes where the lengths are going to cover, okay? The coverage of it. So the conversion layering technique, which means directing all the lengths to a stationary design line opposite the area of the desired length increase. So that basically means this. I'm gonna take this hair instead of combing it straight down like this, okay? I'm gonna take this hair and I'm gonna pull it up across the part here. So that I've inclined over this way and over directed it. If I keep it up like this, it's gonna be 90. If I go over this way, it's gonna be 45. And if I come straight across, it's gonna be zero. Does that make sense to you guys? Zero, 45, and 90, okay? But I'm taking this hair from this side of my ear that should be coming down this way, it's gonna come over this way and over direct it, okay? That's what your conversion layer is. I'm bringing it over, directing it this way so I can get layers to come down on this side. All right, so I can have three different types of projection on that side. Then you have projection for uniform layered, okay? Which is the last form on this. All right, it's also known as normal projection, okay? It is the 90 degree from the curve of the head which basically means the same thing I said about a uniform cut, it's right here. It's four inches out here, it's gonna be four inches here. It's gonna be four inches here, it's gonna be four inches here. Do you see what I'm saying? It could be six inches or five inches, it doesn't matter. Whatever your, your length guide is, it's gonna be the same no matter where you place that comb. Then you know you have that uniform layer cut, okay? Everyone thinks that it's the hardest cut to cut, but I go, all you have to do is keep checking your, your measurements, you know? You've got, a ruler on your comb with those inches right there, just measure that cut. And you're gonna pull straight out from where the head is and that's how you're gonna cut it, okay? Think of if you put your finger in a light socket and your hair just went out like this, right? And you want it to be even, okay? That's exactly what a 90 degree projection is. It's going straight out from the head and it's like this. I don't know how to explain it, it just goes like that, all right? Comes straight out, all right. Um, your next one, which is position your fingers and shears, right? This is the sixth one, all right? 
It refers to the position of your fingers and shears relative to the base parting, okay? It's also known as parallel sculpting, okay? So your fingers are going to be positioned equal distance away from the party, and the result is gonna be like your purest, purest reflection. So think of it as combing the hair down this way. I'm looking for my comb here, okay? I'm trying to show you too. Combing it down like this and taking your fingers like this. So I'm parallel to the party. Does that make sense now? Can you see that? Like this, it'll be combed straight down and my fingers are parallel to that party. That's what they're talking about. And I'm gonna be cutting like this, okay? So finger and shear position, okay? It's the position of the fingers and shears relative to the base parting, also known as parallel sculpting. Your, your fingers are positioned at an equal distance away from the parting, and it results in the purest reflection of the chosen line. As you can see exactly what you're cutting. Think of cutting the bang straight, right? You can see exactly what you're doing. That's what they mean by pure result. Okay, the other form of that position, okay, is going to be non-parallel, okay? And the fingers are positioned at an unequal distance away from the party, okay? Used to create exaggerated lengths. So this one is gonna be cut like this. So I'm gonna be pulling this whole section forward and you see the angle that this comb makes right here? That's how I'm gonna be cutting it, okay? So you can see that I've got short to long, right? Here's my bangs going one way, but now I'm gonna take it this way and I'm gonna have short hair here going to longer hair down here. That's non-parallel. Does that make sense, you guys? Do you understand? Anybody not understand that? Okay, then I'll move on. I just wanna make sure. <laughs> Okay, so that's your finger in shears position. All right, your last one, your seventh one, okay, is your sculpting the design line, okay? And this is your first cut, basically. The design line is an artistic pattern or length guide while you're sculpting. So it's that first cut that you're making, like how short am I going to cut it, okay? And sometimes that's your only clue on if I cut my, exterior this uh, line first, okay? I'll know I'm not gonna go any shorter than that. I can do my layers in between there, okay? That's just one guy, one way of doing it. But if you pull your layers and do all of that first, you don't know how long you're gonna keep the length at the bottom. Just a cue to keep remembering. But you have two types of design line. You have a stationary and you have a mobile, okay? And a stationary guideline, everything's brought down to the same length, okay? That's your stable guideline. Okay, everything's brought down to one point and everything's cut from there. But a mobile guideline, and the best way you can describe it is, I'm gonna drop off a friend and I'm gonna pick up a friend. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut my hair, okay, and cut my point, and then I'm gonna take away some of it and then I'm going to pick up some new hair, all right? So let's say I took this much hair right here and trying to, so you could see it, I don't know if you can, okay? I'm going to take this much hair and I'm going to cut straight across, but I'm going to drop off a friend and then I'm going to pick up some new hair and I'm going to use my previous guide to cut my new hair. And then I'm going to drop off my friend and then I'm going to pick up some new friends and I'm going to cut. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're going to be cutting it. You've got to cut straight across. Okay, that's one way of doing it, but I'm moving in a mobile fashion. So I will cut my first guide this way, but I'm gonna take half of that, okay? Drop it off, and then I'm gonna pick up half of my new friends, okay? And then I'm gonna cut it, because I have a guide from previous to cut straight across. Then I'm gonna drop this one, and I'm gonna pick up my new friends, and I'm gonna cut. Does that make sense to you guys? Tell me if you don't understand that one. I know it looks crazy, but that's basically the easiest way to describe it. You're gonna be picking up and you're moving mobile. That's why. As before, everything was brought to that one point and cut. Okay, because I could bring my whole bang in like this and still have shorter to longer if I was doing stable, but now I'm actually doing mobile, okay? So a mobile guide, they say, it's a small amount of the previously sculpted hair and add new hair to it 
to sculpt it and you have your guidelines. So your guideline just continues to move with you. Does that help you understand it? I see. Okay, you better be giving me thumbs up or something, okay, because I need to know you guys are paying attention. <laughs> I'm going to call on you for answers. All right? Good. Okay. So your last part of this whole thing is what we know as cross-checking. And basically what that means is this. You're checking for accuracy of the sculpted hair, okay, by using the opposite parting pattern. So if I chose to use vertical partings, which would be like, these are my vertical partings, okay, like this. And then I want to go like this to the next section, okay. And I'm moving around vertically, or am I going to use horizontal, which is straight across? So I can either pull it straight out this way, or I'm going to pull it this way for my vertical parting. So if I cut it vertical, I'm going to cross check it horizontal because they should match. Okay. If I cut it horizontally, I should be able to cross check it and check it vertically. It should match, especially on a 90 degree haircut. I'll tell you this much because I teach state board class. I'm like, I will watch the girls do their haircut and they'll all do it vertical. And so I'll go through the check and I'll check it horizontal. And the next thing they do, the next haircut they're practicing, they're all doing it horizontally and then I'll check it vertically. And they're, why do you keep doing it the opposite way? And I go, because that's how you check a haircut. And they're like, I never knew that. I'm like, you had to know that, okay? So they thought that they were kind of cutting through all the stuff. They're like, I'm gonna pout it just like she did and so it's all gonna match. And I'm going, but it should match the opposite way too, silly. So you have to remember that. If you cut it vertically, it should be able to match horizontally. Okay, that's basically what cross checking is. You're checking against the opposite parting pattern for accuracy. Okay, all right, got you through that part. That's not bad, was it? Question Uh huh. So, if you were to cut it vertically and then check it horizontally and it's uneven, would you trim it off? Would you cut it to match? Yep it first or the way you checked it okay so let's say you did it vertically right like this all right and then i wanted to check it horizontally which would be like this right and there was a piece cut off i would cut it off to match that because it should be the same length it should be the same length this way and everything okay doesn't matter where i pick it up it should match and the easiest way to do that is when you can see it you know actually see the in person. I know that sounds really hard to, to explain and I know Connie's tried too. And I get this, this is hard to try and teach this when you can't be here to see it. But there's a way to comb the hair straight up like this. You can see this would be my horizontal, right? And then my vertical would be my little skinny partings going this way. I'm trying to see if that's even right. Okay, so if I cut it off here, then when I did this, I should have, it should be straight across, okay? at each parting, because remember, everything's supposed to be four inches. Well, let's just say my mine was four inches, okay? Four inches, doesn't matter where on the head, it should be four inches. Whether I do it vertically or horizontally, that's a perfect haircut. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. So you, you will be, there will be times when you go to cross check it and you have it a corner off, and so you're gonna take that corner off, okay? That's why you do the cross checking is to, to make sure that everything matches, okay? All right, we good? <laughs> we good to move on? <laughs> All right, so now you're gonna go into what's known as your texturizing techniques, okay? And that's, remember these guys? That little comb on one end and the blade on the other, okay? It's also known as tapering or thinning, okay? That's what these are. So it involves shorter lengths within the form. My form is going to be four inches, right? All of this hair right between here. When I texturize, I'm going to texturize it different lengths, okay? I'm never going to cut it like real close to my scalp because it's going to be poking out everywhere, right? If I do the ends, I'm going to be able to blend the ends. I can do mid shaft to take some of the bulk out or I can go a little bit closer than that if it's really thick. So the general rules for texturizing if you have coarse hair, you're gonna texture at least one and a half inches away from the scalp, okay? If you have coarse hair, it's one and a half inches away. It goes up to three inches, but it's one and a half to three inches. 
okay? Medium textured hair can be texturized at least one inch from the scalp, okay? Fine hair can be texturized as close as one half an inch from the scalp, one half inch, right about like that. And curly hair, curly hair is when you would texturize it dry so that you can see the control and the shrink factor, okay? I'm gonna tell you something on curly hair. Curly hair, you don't know how much it's gonna shrink. Sometimes it shrinks a lot, sometimes it shrinks a little bit, depending on that client's hair. So what I always did with people that had curly hair or if they had a cowlick, I would cut that one, where I'm gonna start it at, I'm gonna cut that area, especially if there's cowlick, right there, I'm gonna cut that piece dry just for a moment. It'll give me my length guide because I don't wanna go any shorter than that, okay? Doing it dry. I actually do have a cowlick on this side of my head, right here. This little bump right here, okay? So in order to cut my hair, when it's dry, I will cut the length I want to set, and then I can get my head wet, and then I can cut my hair. I know that I'm not gonna go any shorter than that length there, because if I do, I'm gonna have bangs up to here. All right, so curly hair the same way. I might take my first cut to make sure that that's where I wanna go. I don't wanna go any shorter than that, okay? That way when I do my, let's say 90 degree haircut, I have a guide length that I'm not gonna go shorter than that because the lady doesn't want hair way up here. She wants hair down here. Do you get what I'm saying? Since curly hair shrinks, you wanna cut it on the longer side. And sometimes just getting your length guide done with dry hair, knowing you will not go shorter than that, is a perfect way to do it until you feel comfortable doing that client's hair. And I'm not, I don't mean just being a good hairdresser to do that or, or a good hair cutter. It means that you're getting used to that client's hair because everybody's head's different, okay? That's what I mean by making sure you don't go too short, okay? And calyx, you know they can stand up like this. It, it shocks most people when they cut my hair that my bangs, when they're wet, like are down to here on this side and this side's up to here. They're like, how does that balance out? I go, it does balance when you dry my hair, okay? When it's dry, this side is like this and then this side's right here. But when it's wet, it looks like this. <laughs> it's the craziest thing because of the way that it shrinks. But if you cut that area where you're not sure how short or how it's going to shrink, cut that little piece dry, at least for your length, you'll be okay. Okay? All right. So texturizing, we gave you how close you can go onto the scalp, depending on how much, how thick the hair is or how coarse it is. But there's three ways that we do that, three of the ways that we do this. We do what's known as the base, the mid strand, and the ends, okay? The base is the area where they said, I can go as close to her scalp. That's basically, excuse me, her base is on the ends. And her, um, excuse me, base is right here. Okay, sorry, base is your end. And then your mid strand's here and your ends are gonna be here. I'm like, confusing the hell out of you, okay. So, on somebody that has coarse hair, I can go as close as one and a half inches. So I can go like right about here if I wanted to take that bulk out. I would start here, I take it, and I always do three cuts. So I'll go here, here, and then on the ends, okay? But if I just wanted to remove the bulk, I would do as close to that one and a half as possible and then just leave it, okay? If I wanted to do the mid strand, okay, I would take it away and I would hit mid strand on the strand itself, one piece. If I wanna do the ends, I'm going to taper just the very ends here, okay? The ends work very great, good when you're trying to blend something. Um, if you're cutting bangs and you don't want them to be, you want them to be full, but you don't want them to look like they're just butchered off at one point, right? So you can texturize those ends and it gives a little bit of texture on the ends. So it looks like it's a little layered, but it's not, it's still a blunt cut. That's what it looks for. The mid strand has been getting most of the excess bulk out of the hair. It's too um, thick. You don't want to cut layers into it because you want to keep the form, but you want to take some of the thickness out of the hair. That's what the mid strand would be for. Okay, and getting close to the base would be when you wanted some height up here. Say somebody that had long hair, right? And they kept saying, I want this, but I don't want layers. I want it to stand up a little bit, but I don't want layers up here. So you'd be texturizing close to the base to give it some height. Does that make sense? So you have to, so close to the scalp would be your rules for it, okay? But then you're going to look at the areas of the hair strand itself where you can texturize it, okay? 
So if I had somebody with fine hair, how close can I get to scalp? Anyone? Fine hair, how close can I get to that scalp? The base? Yeah, how close to that base then can I get? An inch away or something? An inch away, yes, right, okay. Medium hair, I can texturize it an inch away from that scalp or base, and then your coarse hair is gonna be one and a half to three inches, okay? All right, so, any other questions on those three areas where we texturize? Nobody has, has anybody had their hair texturized before? Yep. This last yeah, time, I did. <laughs> yes, Sue's been doing it a couple of times and this last time she shouldn't have done it because now I can't do nothing to my hair. And the reason why that if you texturize it too many times in a row, what happens is as it starts to grow out, this area is real thin and there's no hair to hold down that weight. So it gets like it's all texturized up here and broken hairs it feels like. So I would do it like once, maybe twice on a haircut. I do it once, maybe six weeks when she gets her near next haircut I would do it. But after that I'd wait till I grow out a little bit before I would do it again. Okay, just an FYI. All right. So. Oh, where can I go with this one? Um, there's another part of this, it's called contouring tapering, okay? It's usually performed mid-strand or the ends, those two areas, just to reduce bulk, but it allows the hair to lay closer to the scalp, okay, or closer to the head. This is called a contour taper, all right? Let's say you did um, a gradation in the back, and you might have a little line in there because you tried to match, you know, your blending right through here. They wanted scissors on the top and they wanted this clipper cut in the back. But to blend the clipper into the scissors, it was a little off. So you can take those thinning shears or tapering shears, whatever you want to call them, okay, and you blend them together, okay? There's another one that's called razor rotation, okay? And this basically means using the razor, you're rotating that razor and comb, kind of like what you would do with scissor over comb, Okay, running the comb up and scissors, but you're going to be doing a razor. So it basically, you're just coming up and it's catching the very ends of it. The hair always has to be damp when you're using those razors though, okay? Um, the last one would be expansion tapering. And this is performed near the base or the mid strand to create either expansion and add volume to the hair. So. There's, called, there's one that's called strand tapering. You can use your taper shears with it and it creates that volume or the expansion. And then there's a slicing. So slicing means that you're going to, and this sounds crazy, I'm gonna pull this up this way and I'm gonna hold my shears and I'm gonna slide my shears down this way. This is your slicing. You're just gonna slide your fingers down and the razor, the scissors are kept open like this and they're gonna cut down instead of cutting all the way down. Okay, so glide the open shears along the surface of the hair. All right, that's another way to taper, especially for women that have very, very long hair and they want a little bit of tapering down this way, that's where that gliding comes in with your shears, okay? Because you're not gonna be able to pull it all down to match it if she wants it short up here and it's down long past her waist, okay? It's no way to meet that unless you use the gliding method, okay? All right, short hair techniques. Let's go over over comb techniques, okay? So over comb techniques can create what's known as sculpted short exteriors, okay? They're shorter exterior lengths progressing to longer lengths towards the crown, okay? So it's basically a taper. It's going from shorter here and longer up. All right, you're gonna use the comb as your guide to hold the length while the hair protrudes over the comb as you're sculpting it. So it's basically running that comb up like this, kind of like a clipper over comb. Okay, but you're using your shears to do that. Okay, same method. Um, the shears are positioned parallel to the comb and the tools will move upward in unison. Okay. 
then you can also do clipper over comb. Okay, and your clipper comb is used in the same fashion. All right, the comb is held as your guide to hold the hair and whatever comes protruding through the comb or the teeth, the clipper is going to catch. Okay, so it's sculpted with the clippers. It's a lot quicker than the shears, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, there's another word that we use is called comb control. And this is the angle of the comb and the distance between the comb and the scalp. It will determine how much of the hair is going to be sculpted. So I can hold it, it's kind of hard to see. I'm gonna hold it straight like this, or I can tilt it one way or the other, okay, like this. The angle at which that comb is is gonna determine my inclination. Make sense? You can see it when I do it sideways, right? Okay. All right. So let's talk about low, medium, and high gradation, which is your fades coming up, okay? Your low grad gradation creates the least amount of transparency, okay? It's located just below the occipital. You're only gonna be doing from here to here, like, oops, from your hairline up to where the occipital is at. Okay, that's known as low gradation. Medium gradation creates a medium degree of transparency, and so it extends into the occipital. So you're gonna go up just a little bit higher, and it's a little bit above that occipital. High gradation is gonna give you maximum transparency, okay, and it extends way above the occipital. Okay, so you're still doing what's known as from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, okay? Depending on where you want that inclination to go. So your gradation is just gonna be a taper, how tight you're gonna have it towards the scalp. And then the last thing that we are doing when we're doing our haircuts is we're doing an outline, okay? We're finishing up that last part when we're doing a man's haircut. So outlining is used to define the perimeter whether it's to move around the ear, get around the front, but it's usually performed on short sculptures and particularly in the nape, it starts with, okay? So outlining can be performed with your shears, it can be done with a razor, it can be done with clippers, it can even be done with trimmers, okay? There's many ways to do that outline, but it's just refining the perimeter of the head, okay? There are different outlines you can make, okay? We have, where the hair is actually carved out. I was talking about a U, an upside down U. Um, there's one that could be a W, it could be a V that you keep in the back hairline. So we usually follow the shape of the, the hairline itself, okay? Mine happens to grow like this. So these little ends right here on the sides, it's hard to sort of thing. My ends will come on to the side this way and grow. So my hair is always cut like this because why fight what you already have? Seriously, if I had to <laughs> fight against it, I'd be having all this hair back here to be sticking up and going off crazy. So it's because I would want it to be like in a V, but it doesn't work that way. So I just go with the flow of my hairline. It makes it a lot easier to grow out. <laughs> okay, facial hair. You have to learn about facial hair for cosmetology, all right? This is where you trim the eyebrows, the beard, the goatee, the mustache, any facial hair itself, okay? Even people have you in their ear hair, okay? Just know, and I wanna make this very clear, okay? You, those of you that wax, you do not wax anybody's ear inside their ear ever, ever. I don't care how much they ask you, you do not do that, okay? Unless you never wax somebody's nose with a stick up it, okay? I'm telling you this right now because so many students go back there and go, no, I was shown, I saw it on YouTube and they stuck the wax up their nose and used it and pulled it out. I'm like, no, that's not how you do that. Okay, first of all, if somebody has very thin capillaries inside here, you can cause them to bleed very badly. The other thing on the ears, if you put a stick in someone's ear with wax and try to pull it out, you can pop an eardrum, okay? So you trim with clippers around the hair you may wax the outside of the ear, like the top of it, but you never wax on the inside of the ear at all, okay? Nose, you're going to wax the calf of it this way. When they're laying down, that little wax starts to seep back into, they think it's going down their throat, but it's not. It's gonna go in about that much. I'm gonna show you that much, okay? 
when it hardens, you're gonna pop the edge of it and it'll pull the little hair. You're only getting the hair that's close to the edge, maybe about a quarter of an inch that's inside their nose because the rest of that hair in there is there for a reason. It is filter. Okay, you don't wanna remove all of their hair in their nose, but it does remove the hair that they're always talking about that's in their nose, that they can see, okay? Never use a stick ever, okay? To put up someone's nose or in their ears. And I say this with <laughs> as much passion as I can because I've caught somebody trying to do that. And I'm like, no, I go, cause you can cause major medical damage to someone and you would be responsible for it. And you're working under our licenses, so no, <laughs> okay? All right, um, you can outline your facial hair also on a man for their beard, okay? Just know, I don't think here at the school they charge an extra amount of money when they get their hair cut. We kind of just include it if we do their eyebrows or their little goatee or something like that. But out in the real world, I would charge for facial hair. There's an extra charge for it, okay? So don't, don't cheat yourself on that. All right, sculpting considerations, okay? always important to check your work check the final result before they walk out the door okay you want to look at growth patterns okay is there a cowlick that i have to work worry about is there a swirl or a whirl whatever it's called okay and those are usually found back here that kind of move in a circle a cowlick actually is where the hair moves from one side to the other from the front hairline it'll be right here a widow's peak forms a point at the front. Have you ever seen that? Where it forms like a little point right here? I've had girls that we've actually taken that peak off, that little pointed edge. I'll just wax that off so they have a normal hairline. Um, and then the whirl. So we have widow's peak, a cowlick, and a whirl. Always have to think about how you're going to work that into that haircut. Let's put it that way. Okay. A little bit more length hair is what I'm going to tell you. Okay. When I have a friend that has a widow's peak right here, when we highlight her hair, we can't highlight the front. You know, that money piece that everybody talks about right here. I can't do that with her because it'll form those two peaks right here and it goes up and it just doesn't lay right. So I always get right behind that when I do highlights on her. So you're gonna find that little things like that actually change the way your hair behaves. Because when we put color or bleach or anything on the hair, it does change its texture and the way it behaves. All right, you guys, I'm gonna call it a day today. Are you bored yet? <laughs> All right, good. Okay, I don't even have any homework for you. However, I would like you to write down one thing that you actually remembered that I, you heard me talk about today, okay, that you did not know about until today. Something that I told you that you learned, okay? Whatever it is, Write it down, something that you learned today from this lecture, okay? And send it in, like write it out and send that picture into the zip whip, okay? Which is a text message here, okay? So it's not a bad homework assignment, is it? Okay, that was you, Nick, and Alejandro, you still there? Did he go bye-bye? Malia, 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 Malia. <laughs> Okay, so everyone that was on today gets to write, okay? One thing that they learned today that they didn't know before we started this class. All right, that's gonna be your homework because I've talked enough for today. <laughs> have, a right? good, have a good day. All right, you guys have a good day too, okay? And I'll talk to you, you later. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ah, don't